Hello, my name is Mary Rose, and welcome to the Billion Dollar Painting. Chances are, the first painting that will sell for one billion dollars already exists. And each week, we ask, which one will it be? Today we're going to look at the Chinese art market, and at the work of the artist Wang Meng. As always, you can find accompanying pictures and further reading for today's show on our website, BillionDollarPodcast.com. In the 13th century, a Chinese scholar and poet named Wan Haowen penned the following poem. Corpses sprawled, curled up beside the road. Hordes of half-dead prisoners. Banners, chariots pouring past a flood. Weeping women trail these Uyghur steeds. For each step taken, who won't cast a backward glance? Behind the troops, cheap wooden Buddhas bundled. Kindling, skirl of pipes, bells clanging. Soldiers packed the swirling marketplace. Men of rank imprisoned, pillaged homes. No one knows how many. All year, huge boats sailing to Kaifeng. Bones stacked high like sticks of hemp. The homelands hackled down mulberries. Catalpas flattened into wasteland. How much longer? This I know. North of the Yellow River. Our spirits broken, houses smashed. Thin smoke trails. All that's left of home. The Mongols, Chinese enemies of, from the north, had invaded China and established the Yuan Dynasty in 1271. To learned Chinese men raised during the relative peace and prosperity of the Song Dynasty, it felt like the world was coming to an end. And yet, like so many other periods in history that felt utterly apocalyptic, things did not end, and an entire generation of Chinese had to acclimate themselves to Mongol rule. Some of those in governmental bureaucracy stayed right where they were. The Mongols didn't have any experience running such a large nation. It was just easier to let the people who had been doing the jobs keep doing them. Others were discriminated against and ignored. They were given low positions and little regard. Naturally, many of these men were frustrated that they were being ruled by people that they thought of as savage barbarians. One of these disenchanted men was a painter. He called himself the Yellow Crane Mountain Man. Wang Meng was born in 1308 in the eastern coastal province of Wuxing, now known as Huzhou. Through his mother's line, he was related to the Song Dynasty's royal bloodline, and so it's not surprising that his loyalties led him to resent working for these Mongolian rulers. As an artist, Wang Meng's style is distinguished because, unlike many of what you might think of as a very minimalist style of painting, with a lot of open space and very delicate, very precise lines that fill up the canvas just, just the slightest amount. Wang Meng instead paints very dense paintings. He uses a calligraphy brush on paper as opposed to the popular silk painting of the time, which is almost another way of emphasizing his scholarly belief in heritage. That is to say, that using the tools of the scholar was a political act for him as much as an aesthetic one. Many of his paintings are landscapes, usually mountains, where you get these very dense compositions and tiny little hidden figures can be seen picking their way through these vast mythic landscapes. Of course, when you know about the attitudes of scholars in the Yuan Dynasty, it's no surprise that some of them simply wanted to move off into the mountains, away from barbarous rule. When the Yuan Dynasty fell in 1368, after fewer than 100 years of existence, it was supplanted by the Ming Dynasty. The scholars of the Ming rejoiced in the return of an ethnically Han Chinese dynasty, and celebrated Wang Meng as an exemplar of Chinese strength and values in the face of barbaric adversity. Wang Meng, along with three other painters named Huang Gongwang, Wu Chen, and Ni Zan, came to be called the Four Masters of the Yuan Dynasty. They were called Wen Ren, that is now approximately literati painters. They were scholarly gentlemen who took up the brush in these dark and dangerous times, and they influenced generations of Chinese artists in the coming centuries. During the final years of the Yuan Dynasty, Wang Meng retired from life as a scribe to live on Yellow Crane Mountain, and he continued to paint. He was there 
when the dynasty fell and the Ming rose. Wang Meng lived until 1385, outliving the Yuan dynasty by nearly 20 years. It's not exactly certain how many works he completed during this time. Of course, with artworks this old, it's very difficult to tell. But there are some that still survive. And one of those paintings we're going to discuss today. It's called Zhichuan Resettlement. It was painted in 1350. You might be forgiven at first when looking at this painting for thinking that it's just a landscape of mountains. The great majority of this painting is dominated by darkly painted cliffs, hills, and trees. And yet, as you look closer, you can see several little human details start to make themselves apparent. A small house is nestled into the hill at the top left of the painting, near what looks to be a small waterfall. At the bottom of the painting, several figures walk up the mountain path with two oxen. Among these figures, we know from the inscription, is Gi Hong, who is also called either Ko Hong or Zi Chuan. Today, he's known as one of the founders of Chinese medicine. The painting, Zi Chuan Resettlement, takes its name from him. Gi Hong lived in what we call the Period of Disunity, which was a period between 220 and 589 CE, where China had split into different warring nations and factions that battled for the throne. He was born in 317 CE in the Dangyang Prefecture, part of a wealthy scholarly family. He progressed through his ordinary scholar's education and moved into an early career in military service. All the while, while he was on these campaigns, he wrote liberally on Taoism and Confucianism, keeping up to date with the scholarly discourse of the day. And yet, he had this relatively successful military career as well. Upon his discharge, he was awarded the honorary title General Who Makes Waves Submit, which is an honorific I think any of us would be proud of today. Gi Hong's story might sound a little familiar at this point. Upon his retirement, Gi Hong attempted to travel outside of the borders, but he was detained, and he was disgusted by this political climate where these warring factions felt they could limit the movement of scholars. So, Gi Hong retired to the Lufu Mountain in the province of Guangzhou and dedicated himself to the solitary study of medicine. He pursued immortality with a combination of study of Taoist and Confucius texts and herbal and alchemical experiments. Of course, he did not succeed in his pursuit of immortality, and he died in 343. So, looking at that story, it's not hard to see why Wang Meng, who himself had grown so disgusted by the turmoil of the Yuan Dynasty, chose Gi Hong's movement into the mountains for his subject matter. Gi Hong was a famous figure in the Yuan Dynasty. Many people responded to his desires to hide himself away in the mountains and avoid all the political hoopla that was happening. Wang Meng almost certainly read some of Gi Hong's surviving writings, many of which emphasized how fleeting life was in these uncertain times. He must have felt there was a lot in common between the long-suffering scholars of the period of disunity and his own time under Mongol rule. And he painted this sort of subject matter of hermits and Gi Hong specifically several times. Some scholars suggested that Wang Meng used Gi Hong as a metaphor for himself. He might have even been inspired directly by Gi Hong's movement into the mountains for his own movement. Wang Meng's works can be found in museums in China and abroad, with prominent examples in the Shanghai Museum, the National Palace Museum, Smithsonian's Freer Sackler Galleries, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art, among others. Of course, a very select few of them are still in private hands. Sichuan Resettlement is one such painting. Today we're going to turn our attentions to the Chinese art market. When talking about the Chinese art market, I'm going to make a distinction between the amount that Chinese collectors participate in the global market economy and the market that happens within China itself, and we'll tackle them in that order. The global art market is notoriously difficult to pin down. It's an international market, which means that the very wealthy can usually conduct transactions in locations where they do not have to report or pay taxes on their purchases. This is what makes the art market so rife with instances of money laundering and fraud. There is no public database that will tell you who owns what painting. 
that you can follow to make sure that everyone is getting it taxed appropriately. Estimates as to the annual sales of art vary wildly, but to give us some idea, the economist Claire McAndrew puts the number somewhere at $63.7 billion in 2017, which is a 12% increase from the number in 2016. It's worth noting that the paintings we discuss in this podcast, the ultra-expensive paintings, are a tiny fraction of this global art market. In 2017, only one out of every hundred paintings sold for over one million dollars at these major auction houses. Most of them you're going to see in the thousands to hundreds of thousands range. So if you look at it by volume, they seem pretty tiny. But if you look at it by value, paintings of over one million dollars made up 64% of profits in 2017, which was up by 48% that was the number in 2016. So what does this mean? It means there's this huge imbalance there. Out of all the paintings sold in the world, relatively few of them are ultra expensive, but they're becoming so much more expensive each time they sell, meaning that they dominate the market even if they're relatively few in number. This is the kind of exponential increase that makes me think of a billion dollar painting. It's not that far on the horizon. So if we look at how much Chinese collectors participate in that economy, this is a massive portion. Chinese collectors account for 21% of the global art market. And to give you some idea, the leading, I guess you would call it demographic, is the current American share of 42%. Chinese collectors are growing in prominence and importance. They're collecting more artwork of higher caliber every year. And this is why you're going to see so many people bidding on the phones at high profile auctions. It's because they're bidding from half a world away. Why is the portion so large? The amount of Chinese billionaires in 2017 doubled, making 26% of the world's billionaires Chinese and the number could increase from there. As I've mentioned before, where there's money, the pursuit of art will follow. It's kind of, when you think about it, one of those things where, I mean, what do wealthy people want? Wealthy people want nice houses. They're all going to want a nice house. They're all going to want a nice watch. They're all going to want a nice car. But only one person can own a unique painting. And so to access these ultra expensive paintings, is the ultimate status symbol for new wealth. So then, let's turn to the market within China. Here again, we're going to see growth. The China Association of Auctioneers and Artnet put out this annual report of the global Chinese art auction market. I'm going to link this report in the show notes. It is absolutely fascinating, but I won't cover it all here. I don't want to bog us down too much with numbers. What I do want to point out is that the total sale of the Chinese art and antiquities market in 2017 was around $7.1 billion, which went up 7% from the 2016 report. Again, like we saw in the global market, the portion of expensive paintings is not getting a much larger number, but the prices are vastly increasing, doubling in between 2016 and 2017. The golden year for the Chinese market to date was 2011, which totaled at $10 billion. These sales also included our painting that we discussed today, Zichuan Resettlement, which sold on June 4th of 2011 for $62.1 million through the Beijing Poly Auction House. At that time, it broke the record for the most expensive Chinese painting at auction. The buyer and seller were both anonymous, but what we do know comes from within the auction house itself. The head of the ancient painting department at Beijing Poly Auction Company, a man named Zhu Xingyang, said that, quote, this painting reflects the inner thoughts of the intelligentsia back in the Ming Dynasty, whose works pursued an artistic utopia and freedom, unquote. So you can see here what he sees in it. It's a kind of Chinese national pride, and there's also a political dimension as well. For a country which sometimes has a very tricky relationship with free speech, 
there's something very appealing for the wealthy in this idea of a scholar who could go off into the wilderness and speak his mind, or at least write it down. It would seem that in times when the market is doing well, valuable artworks by renowned artists tend to do extremely well. And an artist who represents a point of national pride in the face of adversity? Well, he's going to do very well indeed. So what does this all mean? The global art market, and the Chinese market in general, are perfectly primed for record-breaking artworks. The record for the most expensive Chinese painting at auction was broken by Qi Bishai. The record for the most expensive Chinese painting at auction was broken by Qi Baishi with a collection of 12 landscape paintings that he created in 1925, which sold for $141 million in 2017. This was a massive success all around. People thought it would herald the coming of the 2011 golden year of collecting in the Chinese market. And yet, it was followed very soon after by a scroll attributed to Chinese artist Su Shi from the 11th century, which met a relatively cool reception and fell beneath its estimate at Christie's Hong Kong, selling for just $59.2 million. Again, to clarify, $59.2 million is still, in the grand scheme of paintings, very expensive, but Christie's at this point had been giving this work of art, this work of art that's almost a millennium old, what they called the Salvatore Mundi treatment, that is this kind of star-studded celebrity tour across the world, all of this devotion poured into it, and they even touted Su Shi as the Chinese Da Vinci. Still, Questions over its provenance were what led collectors to be a little uh, curious about it, and nobody wants to be the f one to go in on a bad deal. Only three people ended up bidding at that auction. So, why didn't it become the mythical second coming of 2011? A sale of like that of the Qi Bai Shi paintings has to be followed up by more successful sales in order to make everyone else jump on board. It's got to be a big snowball effect. Collectors can be nervous people, financially conservative and wary. As I've said, nobody wants to be the one who gets the bad end of the deal. And there's this problem in the Chinese market as well. The Chinese market tends to put the onus on the collector to find out if a work is authentic, rather than putting it on the auction house. That isn't to say that either Christie's or Sotheby's or any of the major Western art auction houses always 100% guarantee the authenticity of their paintings. As we've seen, authenticity is just too tricky for that. But that being said, they do tend to do their own research and put their own efforts in to give at least some sort of semi-professional guarantee. That's not the case in the Chinese art market. Further, there's been this recent rash of high-profile arrests surrounding fake paintings that was making everyone really nervous. So, basically, in China, provenance is becoming extremely important. You'll even see this if you're very familiar with Chinese and, to another extent, Japanese paintings as well. They will all carry these red seals of collectors, and this is a mark of provenance. And you really want to study those collections as well. For the Su Shi painting, it was kept in a relatively undocumented imperial collection. It wasn't something that anybody really had any trust in. So when new paintings come to the market, there's a lot of suspicion there, and they have to be backed up in the literature. So the difference between that and the painting that broke the record during the 2011 golden year, that is our Zichuan resettlement, is that the Zichuan resettlement is concrete in its provenance. It's been accepted once and it will be accepted again as the genuine article. If the Chinese markets were to experience another golden year like 2011, I wouldn't be surprised if Zichuan Resettlement or another work of art by Wang Meng came to the auction block again. If it did, and if the conditions were right, 
we might experience the first billion dollar painting. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to subscribe and leave a five-star review. It really helps more people find their way to the show. You can also find more information about Zichuan Resettlement and other works of art by visiting the website BillionDollarPodcast.com. You can also tweet at us at Billion Painting, follow our Instagram at the Billion Dollar Painting, or you can email us at the Billion Dollar Painting at gmail.com. See you next week.